Um, so where is it going to be broadcast then? Uh, it, on on my YouTube ID. On your YouTube ID. ID. Okay. Yeah. Live. So if nobody has any objections, we'll, uh, we'll record uh, the session as soon as we like start the presentation. Um, are all the participating teams, teams here? Sorry, we cannot hear you very well. Uh, She's young here. Yeah, Vivek, I think we, we might want to start now and then uh, people will join us on their own time. Uh, yeah. Should I say something to introduce uh, the challenge before you, you give your presentation? Uh, maybe? Yeah, sure. So, so just switch the video on. I would like to thank everybody. So my name is Fabio Puzzolini, I'm a professor of artificial intelligence at Oxford Brookes University. And the challenge, this challenge has been organized by um, our Visual Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, um, in particular in the persons of uh, Vivek Singh, who is a research fellow with us, and with the assistance of the other members of the SARAS team, as well as uh, Dr. Gurkit Singh from um, ETH Zurich, used to be a PhD student of mine. And the challenge has been, has been organized as part of the uh, SARAS uh, European Horizon 2020 project. SARAS means so Smart Autonomous Robotic Assistant Surgeon. And the purpose of the project is to replace uh, assistant surgeon with two fully autonomous arms. And as part of that challenge, recognizing the actions and detecting the actions performed by the surgeons in real time from endoscopic video is key. And this is the reason why we organized this. We proposed to organize this event, it was accepted by MIDL. So we are very happy that um, we were able to do that. The challenge has been quite successful. We had 150, around 150 entries, I believe, and with 15, around 15 participating teams. Correct me if I'm wrong, Vivek. But I'll leave the, I'll leave the, the screen to Vivek uh, for a brief introduction to the challenge. And then I think um, Carmela from Ospedale San Raffaele in Milan will take over and describe the data set more in detail. Um, Dr. Riccardo Muradore was assistant professor at the University of Verona and is coordinator of SARAS. We'll um, talk, talk about SARAS uh, right afterwards you know, to put the challenge in context, into context. Now we'll have uh, Professor Juan Vax to give a, new, a keynote speech on, uh, on surgical action recognition from the University of Purdue. Um, the four top participating teams will uh, illustrate their methods. They're gonna have around 20, 25 minutes each. And finally, I will conclude. So um, this is the outline schedule. Uh, at some point in between, we'll have a, we will have a little break because otherwise, you know, three hours straight session would be pretty hard on everybody. So um, that's that's the schedule. I'll, I'll just leave the, the, the table to be back for his presentation, the introduction of the, the challenge. Uh, thank you, Fabio. I hope everyone is able to see my screen.
Yes. Yeah. So as we mentioned, the schedule of the event is starts from two and it ends on five thirty. Uh, first, it will be me and Carmela from Sanfer Hospital. We will give the basic introduction on the you know, what is the data set we used, how we developed data set, and what are the challenges in this data set, particular to the detection, action detection task. And that will be followed by Professor Ricardo from University of Verona. And he will give some introduction on what kind of research that we uh, is going on in SARS in, in different uh, areas. And that will be followed by Professor Juan Pablo uh, uh, by his keynote on challenges of the computer vision. And then there will be two talks from the participants followed by a break and again then two talks from the participants and then followed by the closing remarks from Professor Fabio. This is the organizing team. Uh, uh, there were four members from the Oxford Brooks University, Professor Fabio, me, Inaskaya Madarova, uh, Gurkirat Singh, Dr. Gurkirat Singh. He is now in ETS Zurich, Computer Vision Lab, and Francis Kepinga, and he has graduated actually. So the other organizations involved were Sarupar Hospital from Milan and University of Vienna. So first of all, I would like to introduce this challenge. In this challenge, the, the task, as the, as the name suggests, the task was to identify the action that are being performed by surgeon using the video from the endoscope. And the video that we are using is the RGB video. And the task is to localize the action and then identify that action, what kind of action surgeon is performing. So to identify this action, for, for that purpose, we use we have to develop some kind of metric that we want to use to evaluate the quality of the algorithm that the participants are providing. So we use average precision, which is the standard metric in all the detection tasks. But there is a bit of the tweak that we use. So here we use three different IOU thresholds. Uh, for computing the mean average precision. So first threshold was 0.1, and second was 0.3, and then third was 0.5. So the mean of all the three threshold, IOU threshold, which is intersection of a union score, were used to compute the quality of the algorithm, how good the detection is. The aim for providing these three different IOU threshold is that we want to uh, learn the different characteristics or uh, 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 we want to identify different characteristics of the algorithm that we are deploying on this. So for example, like if we are using 0.5 threshold, then the localization quality of that algorithm is should be much higher in comparison to the classification accuracy. And if we are using 0.1 threshold, then even we just at, at point one threshold, we just want the approximate location of where the action is being performed, and we are more more interested toward what, what actions are present in, in current frame. So, if we take the mean, that, that is some somehow represents how good where the algorithm is all, in all 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 three uh, all, all three in thresholds. So this data set that we provided, this data set has 21 classes. So initially we, we came up with 35 classes, but it, when the initial tests were performed and we found out the complexity of this data set was too high and uh, we, we were not able to infer any valuable information out of those classes. So after, again, after discussion with the surgeons from Sarfa Hospital, we, we came up with 21 action classes. So it is, it is, the, it is the trade of between both the complexity as well uh, and complexity and the quality. So if we increase the complexity up to 35, although the, the 
we, we, sh we should be able to infer more information out of the detection. But uh, the, it, 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 the algorithms are not incapable of uh, uh, correctly localizing these classes. Yeah, so for, for, for the purpose of this challenge, uh, all the annotations are performed at one FPS, one frame per second, although the recorded videos from the, um, the endoscope were at 30 frame per second. Uh, for this data set, for this ESA challenge, uh, we, we use YOLO style format uh, to provide the annotations of the bounding boxes, which is the center location X, Y, and width and height. And each frame can have more than, more than one label or more than one action. These are a few examples of the annotation. It, as you can see here, uh, you, this is, there are two actions in each of the frames. And it is easily visible that how complex this scene is in comparison to the computer vision problems in that we, where we perform the standard uh, detection task. So here the boundaries of the objects are not that clear. And this also creates a challenge for the annotator, like, because in, in this kind of science, it's very hard to standardize the annotation procedure. And there is always some variance between two different annotators. So yeah, that is it. So this table gives the total number of samples in the data set. First column is the training samples. Second column is the validation, and third is the test sample. So in total, we recorded four videos of prospecting procedure. Out of those four videos, two videos were used for training and one for validation. And last video was used for uh, testing. For the testing purpose, we, we, we selected the video which had lowest variance between sample count. So here is, you can see in training as well as validation. So the sample count per class is highly variable and data set is a bit skewed. Actually, this is due to the general nature of the prospecting procedures that some actions come more often instead of the others. But it's still like to, to, to have a good quality evaluation, the test video was kept the one which had lowest variance. More information can be found on this link. So what are the challenges of this data set? So first thing, the biggest problem is that in, if we compare the, the detection in the medical images, it's very different in comparison to the standard computer vision task. We see in, in com standard computer vision task is highly contrastive and objects have fixed boundaries and there is a lot of color and texture variations to, to identify the shapes. But a, as we have seen in the previous example, the variation in the scene is, is between different objects and the and different organs, if we see, it is not that high and the boundaries of the objects are not that clear. So it's very hard to identify which object is present and where to draw the boundary boxes and the action. And the, another problem is the deformation. The organs are deformable and during the surgery, organs change a lot in shape as well as in looks. And, and, and that, is, that, that does make it, makes it very hard to learn the structural features that can be uniformly used throughout. Another challenge that, that comes with the detection in medical images is the motion of the endoscope camera. So endoscope camera is very in very close proximity during the prostatectomy, and when the camera moves, the appearance of the organs changes a lot, and that, that again adds up to the complexity of the problem. And finally, the action classes that we decided. The 21 action classes, they were like the examples here are like cutting in the colon and folding prostate. So it's not just the action performed by SARS arms or Da Vinci arms, the tools that we are using. 
it's also it also contains the organ on which we are performing the uh, the action so so it's, it's a kind of a more informative kind of action detection where we also know like on which action what kind of action we are performing but it also adds up to the complexity because now you need to know what the organ is on which the action is the tool is performing the action so so there were like more than 200 entries and then in, in this challenge this was the first year of this challenge but still like we, we were able to get like 200 more than 200 entries so we, we saw a lot of interest from people and uh, although there was very little time to design the algorithm but still like we, we got 75 uh, submi uh, submissions of results and these are like 20, 20 23 top results that uh, there were submitted and baseline is not in one of them so yeah they didn't they were not in this so if we compile up these results so the baseline was the mean average, mean average precision for baseline is 0.16 and average precision at 0.1 threshold is 0.21 and 0.3 uh, average precision at 0.3 is 0.17 and as we increase the IOU threshold the uh, average precision value goes down and that is obvious because it has to be more accurate on detection uh, and localization task so the best model that performed on mean average precision also performed best on average precision at 10 as well as on average precision at 30. that means at every precision at iou 0.1 and iou 0.3 so if we so from here we can a bit infer that generally if we loosen the the criteria of correct localization the algorithm the same algorithm is able to get the good group classification accuracy on the actions if the criteria for the detection and the localization or, or finding the boundary box is a bit loose but if if we look at the best uh, average precision at 0.5 threshold, the algorithm is, is different from the others. So here, the algorithm which performs highest on AP50 is not able to perform that well on uh, AP10 and AP30. So we, we haven't received yet the reports from the participants, but it will be interesting to see in what, why there is this difference. And now I would like to request um, uh, my friend Camilo from Santa Hospital to, to explain a bit on the data set and how the annotation was performed. Thank, Thank you, you Vivek, um, for this introduction. I would just like to add uh, one comment here. So the reasons why we propose this challenge is twofold, basically. Number one is that although there have been like um, challenges related to action recognition in a surgical context in the past, there never was a challenge like combining recognition with localization, so proper action detection as standard in the computer vision community. So this is the reason why we thought this challenge uh, would be the first of its kind, and I still think it is. So this is really the first, uh, the first challenge ever that addresses action detection in a surgical robotics uh, context. And the other reason is that uh, we, want to pro we want to propose a new uh, additional benchmark for actual detection to the computer vision community, which has largely been using um, two standard benchmarks, uh, UCF-11 and GHMDB-21. We, where videos are taken from the YouTube or movies or other sources over the internet, but they don't really, they don't really present the same kind of challenges as um, surgical videos do and uh, those that we have just explained in this presentation. So we think this new data set can, can provide complementary a complementary challenge to that of uh, currently accepted uh, standard benchmarks in action detection. And then I, I will leave the, the, the floor to Carmela, I believe, from San Rafael Hospital. She will explain a little bit more detail 
um, the annotation process, the nature of the data set, and so on. Yes, maybe you can speak up a little bit. Uh, okay. We can hear a bit far away. Okay. Uh, I'm the researcher of, uh, of Sankara Hospital in Milano. The target of this blog is to send the creation of Tarot dataset for some journal action detection. Oh, that, that's much better, thank you. Sorry. Uh, first, first of all, as the first project will uh, allow to, uh, the, the next generation of technical robots to execute minimal invasive procedures with only the main surgeon without the need of an assistant. Uh, through the collaboration of nine European partners, including universities, hospitals, and uh, small medium enterprises, SARS will develop a new robotic system consisting of a pair of cooperating robotic uh, arms uh, holding the laparoscopic uh, uh, instruments. Robotic uh, procedures represent the latest development in minimal invasive uh, surgical techniques. And two surgeons are needed in the operation room. The main surgeon could operate the robotic uh, surgery platform and perform the key phases of, surgical, of the surgical procedure. Uh, and the assistant surgeon who uh, assists the main surgeon and uses the laparoscopic instrument near the surgical table. Uh, the gold standard procedure for robotic minimal invasive surgery is considered robot assisted radical prostatectomy with a honeyed rat. Uh, rat, uh, in particular, the rat procedure is the rejection of the infrastructure gland in patients with prostate uh, cancer and uh, uh, the fifth cause of cancer mortality in, uh, in men. Uh, regarding the rat uh, surgical procedure, uh, it's important to understand the stock conditions and the surgical instrument uh, used. Stock are medical devices in uh, plastic or metal, and they are inserted in patients' abdomen. Sorry, uh, Camilla. Sorry, yeah. Camilla. Can you do something to improve the quality of your voice? Um, are you using uh, headsets? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's a bit variable. Are you using headsets with the microphone? Um, one moment. Now? Yeah, sound, sounds better. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Uh, no worries. Uh, regarding the last surgical procedure, uh, it's important to understand the, um, understand the trocar position and surgical instrument uh, used. There are many options to insert the trockers in patients' abdomen, as studied from literature reviews, but we analyzed the current practice carried out at some Australian hospitals. Four metallic robotic trockers are used by the robotic arms of the surgeon, and two assistant ports are used for laparoscopic instruments by the assistant surgeon. The first uh, trocker uh, over the umbilicus for camera port and other ports for uh, surgical. In uh, this slide, uh, you can see in the figure above the positioning of patients uh, with an inclination of surgical table of 30 degrees, while in figure below, the figure below shows uh, the phenomenal positioning created through the hole in which the, uh, the camera is uh, inserted uh, subsequently in order to increase the working space. Uh, the surgical instrument in um, the main surgeon and uh, at the Vinci control uh, can operate uh, four robotic arms on which are mounted laparoscopic instruments uh, in, uh, in the table. The camera mounted on the first arm of the Da Vinci uh, is the crucial uh, uh, important instrument for the surgeon action uh, detection. While uh, the instrument mounted on uh, Sarah's uh, assisted robotic arms are uh, different, and during the surgical procedure, there are uh, many changes between, uh, uh, between trockers. Uh, 
Uh, let's focus now on the modeling of larger figures that are distinct from literature studies and video recorded from from the endoscope. On this basis, uh, the RAP has been studied and uh, modeled uh, through the reference granularity uh, level, uh, comprising the procedure. Uh, the procedure then is composed of a list of phases, where a phase is defined as the major type of uh, events occurring during uh, surgery. Each phase is composed by several steps, a sequence of activities performed to uh, reach to achieve a surgical objective. Uh, the activity is defined as a physical uh, task, and motion can be considered a, a surgical uh, task. For the last level of granularity, the image or, uh, or video are uh, uh, could be used for understanding the details of the rough uh, surgical procedure. To provide a comprehensive overview of the surgical process, we have used the reference uh, granularity levels also uh, following the uh, point. The anatomical site in which the surgical action are uh, performed, the anatomic, uh, anatomical provision results, the surgical instrument and use, and access points uh, choker. The following uh, table shows an example of modeling of rough surgical procedure. Let's start now with the aim of this event uh, regarding the explanation of class of surgeon uh, uh, action detection in the last procedure. Closely thanks to the collaboration between the surgeons of the hospital and the Oxford Brooks University. The main objective is to uh, predict the uh, bounding box uh, and the, the label action class for each surgical action that by uh, the main or assistant stadium. To uh, achieve this uh, goal, we acquired uh, anonymized, four anonymized videos of the complete class procedure held at uh, San Raffaele Hospital. Uh, the, uh, these videos have been recorded uh, at uh, 30 frames per second with uh, the endoscope uh, mounted on uh, the first, uh, the, on the first uh, arm of the limousine system. And video, uh, videos start with the insertion of surgical robotic and laparoscopic uh, instruments in patient's abdomen and uh, stop with uh, the hand of surgery with removal of the endoscope. Uh, after requiring uh, data using uh, the endoscope, we choose an annotation tool uh, we, uh, which associates a, an action a label, as you can see the figure on the right. Uh, each surgical action required by the last surgical procedure. Each video frame was uh, manually annotated using uh, the visual object uh, typing tool, uh, that is a Microsoft Open Source tool used for drawing bounding boxes, rectangular in shape in this case, around the region with the uh, uh, action of interest, and uh, uh, performed, uh, this action is performed by me or by the assistant surgeon. The annotation is performed at one frame per uh, one frame per second. Using uh, visual object annotation tool and uh, uh, on the basis of the uh, uh, axis, we collected a uh, list of 21 uh, labels or action classes, uh, action classes uh, on the basis of the modeling of RAS video shown previously. Each action class has an identification code that is a number and a class name that represents, uh, represents the specific action uh, carried out uh, by male or assistant surgeon. The list of action classes is developed with uh, the assistance of medical professionals as well as uh, um, expert surgeons. Uh, but uh, who, who are the annotators? The, um, they are at least three independent annotators that have been uh, uh, the first level annotators were medical researchers with two years of uh, experience in prostatectomy surgery, and they, they had a background in laparoscopic uh, uh, surgery. And computer science students, uh, research students, who have been working with the surgeon for 20 years. And uh, uh, the second level annotators are expert surgeons in laparoscopic and robotic radical prostatectomy. Uh, the agreement between
between uh, annotators were solved through uh, continual discussion. Um, annotators were instructed by the expert guardians on how to recognize uh, the various surgical actions and how to draw the bounding box uh, around uh, the action of the uh, inaction of, of interest. The related annotation protocol comprises the following red lines, uh, useful, uh, the following red lines. In the first point, each bounding box is contained both the organ and the table. So in the second point, you uh, balance the presence of food and the organs uh, um, in a bounding box. Uh, a bounding box are uh, related to the contains 37 uh, of the tools and organs. Um, uh, in the third point, uh, an action list is considered uh, uh, only in the time when uh, this, when uh, it will be closed uh, now to the uh, to the organ of interest, uh, and an action stop when tool starts to move away from uh, from the organ. Uh, in the last point, each video frame can have two uh, or more actions, uh, which one in boxes uh, can be overlapped. As we can see in the figure uh, on the right. Um, in conclusion, the work uh, of Sergeant, uh, the task of Sergeant Action Detection Graph uh, Procedure led to the creation of uh, uh, the Copic Sergeant Action Detection Dataset, uh, which purpose is to provide a benchmark for a uh, medical computer uh, commu vision community in order to develop and test the algorithm for algorithm for surgical robotics. Um, to the best of our knowledge, this talent presents the first benchmark data set for action detection in surgical field. And it is the way for the introduction of the partial autonomy in surgical robotics. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carmela. Thank you for, for your very accurate description of this. If there are any questions, uh, guys, feel free to ask. I mean, um, we have a bit of a margin, so anything that is not clear, you, you feel free to ask questions. I think we want this session to be as interactive as possible. Otherwise, I'll just, uh, if Ricardo is here, I'll just leave to the floor to Ricardo to present uh, Saras uh, in a bit more like a wider, a bit wider, wider view on Saras. This okay. is the first, uh, the first uh, research project that tries to introduce full autonomy in surgical robotics. Okay, uh, Fabio, do you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you very well, thank you. Okay, perfect, good. So, do you see the slide? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Good. So, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Ricardo Muradore, and I'm coordinating uh, the, the SARAS project. As uh, Fabio mentioned at the very beginning, SARAS stands for, uh, is the acronym of uh, Smart Autonomous Robotic Assistant Surgeon. And uh, the goal of this presentation is uh, Mm. Uh, to give you a bird's eye view about uh, SARAS, uh, and I will not go into details, uh, technical details, uh, but uh, I would like to let you know from where uh, the data set that we are talking about comes and uh, why uh, its analysis using uh, machine learning techniques uh, is very important uh, for uh, our project. Uh, so uh, let me start with uh, a video that uh, uh, show pretty well uh, the ambitions of SARAS and where we are right now. Uh, just to tell you that uh, SARAS project started uh, at the beginning of uh, 2018 and uh, will last until uh, uh, June uh, next year. So this is a video that describe, uh, describes SARAS.
Nowadays, during robotic, minimally invasive surgeries, two surgeons are needed in the operating room. The main surgeon, who teleoperates the robotic surgery platform, and the assistant surgeon, who uses laparoscopic instruments to provide support during the procedure. The SARS project will allow the next generation of surgical robots to execute minimally invasive procedures with only the main surgeon, without the need of an assistant. Thus, obtaining a reduction in costs, a reduction in hospital waiting lists, and an improvement in the efficiency of the health system. Through the collaboration of nine European partners, including universities, hospitals, and small-medium enterprises, SARS will develop a new robotic system, consisting of a pair of cooperating robotic arms holding off-the-shelf laparoscopic instruments. The SARS system will autonomously perform specific tasks currently carried out by the assistant surgeon during a robotic or a laparoscopic procedure. Since 2018, the SARS consortium focused on the development of 1. A pair of robotic arms to be fixed directly on the operating table, controlling off-the-shelf laparoscopic tools. 2. A bilateral teleoperation architecture to allow remote control of the SARS arms by the assistant surgeon. 3. A perception module to recognize the action of basic surgical tasks and to detect organs. 4. A cognitive module capable of collecting the outputs of the perception module and planning collision-free trajectories of the SARS arms to execute surgical tasks like cutting tissues and threads or holding and moving organs. All these components have been integrated into the first release of the SARS system. The so-called multi-robot surgery platform is composed of a remotely controlled version of the SARS arms to be used by the assistant surgeon cooperating with a commercial robotic system to be used by the first surgeon. Expert urological surgeons tested the multi-robot surgery platform by simulating a robotic assisted radical prostatectomy RAM, on advanced human abdominal synthetic phantoms developed during the project. The collected data will trigger the implementation of the next two releases of the SARS system. In the first one, called Solo Surgery, the robotic system will replace the assistant, while the main surgeon performs the operation through the console of the commercial robotic system. In the second one, called Lapro 2.0 Surgery, it will play the role of the assistant, while the main surgeon uses standard handheld laparoscopic tools. Therefore, Cyrus Multi-Robot Surgery is the first step towards the next generation of surgical robotic systems merging artificial intelligence, computer vision, machine learning, and cognitive control for smarter and safer hospitals. So just to uh, recap, uh, so uh, nowadays in the operating room, there are two surgeons. The first one, the main surgeon, is seated at the Da Vinci console. The Da Vinci is uh, the uh, a robotic uh, uh, system for uh, minimal invasive surgery. And then uh, we have another surgeon, um, the assistant surgeon, that is next to the patient uh, and help the main surgeon using standard laparoscopic tools. Uh, and the assistant surgeon uh, is aware of what is going in the, uh, in the belly, actually, of the patient just by looking at uh, the video that the, the screen that you can see here that, that is exactly the images that come from the endoscopic uh, camera so uh, in order to reach uh, uh, this goal so the solo surgery uh, system uh, we need uh, to uh, to um, meet uh, uh, three uh, main objectives. The first one is the translation of the medical knowledge into an engineering formalism easy to be interpreted by the uh, autonomous system. So uh, medical knowledge is, is quite complicated to engineerize, uh, so this is not at all a trivial, uh, a trivial task. The second objective is uh, to uh, design a perception module that should be able to infer the status of the procedure, so phase uh, and uh, action uh, detection, and also to understand what the main surgeon uh, is, uh, what the main surgeon needs from Saras uh, in the 
uh, next phases of the procedure in order to anticipate uh, his or her uh, needs. And then we have to divide to design a cognitive uh, control module that actually uh, elaborate uh, the information coming from the perception modules and uh, uh, makes uh, decision. So in our context, uh, decide how to move uh, and where to move uh, uh, the robotic uh, arms. The impact of SARAS are, are I mean, if you uh, succeed in our objectives are, are quite important because you can and decrease the cost per procedure because you actually have just one uh, surgeon in the operating room instead of two. Uh, also, to, we can increase the surgeon awareness about uh, uh, the procedure because you can provide uh, further information uh, in the uh, Da Vinci console over the procedure. And then uh, we can develop what uh, is called uh, nowadays the embodied AI, a fully embodied AI system. So. Uh, a system that relies on AI uh, subsystem to uh, understand what's going on, uh, but also to make uh, to make decision and then uh, to act on the environment. So in our case, uh, moving uh, laparoscopic uh, tools mounted on a robotic arm. So as uh, shown in the video, we are uh, we go through uh, three platforms. So on the left, you can see the standard uh, situation uh, nowadays. So we have the surgeon at the Da Vinci console and the assistant next to the patient. And our target is the Laparo, what we call the Laparo 2.0 surgery. So uh, laparoscopic intervention where the uh, surgeon is uh, using uh, standard laparoscopic tools, uh, whereas the SARS uh, platform play the role of the assistant. Uh, to reach, uh, I mean, to go to this uh, platform, uh, we need, we develop uh, in the first two years of the project, uh, uh, what we call the multi-robot surgery. So in this platform, uh, the assistant is not using directly the laparoscopic tools, but uh, uh, he or she is controlling remotely the, uh, the laparoscopic tools mounted on the robot using a, a, a haptic uh, uh, interface. And this is quite important because if you need to collect uh, useful uh, information from this video, so you need uh, not only to collect uh, uh, video streaming as in the, uh, in the data set we are talking about uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this event, but also the kinematics of both uh, the uh, arms controlled by the main soldier, but also the kinematics of the uh, laparoscopic tools uh, controlled by the assistant. When uh, we have good data, you can uh, really train in an uh, effective way, in a, an effective way the, uh, the machine learning uh, uh, algorithm. And so, yeah, you can really have a reliable autonomy that we implement in the solo surgeon platform and in the Laparo 2.0 uh, surgery platform. So this is uh, um, actually uh, the, uh, the architecture, so it's, it is quite complex, but I don't want to go uh, to this uh, detail because these are not important uh, in today, but uh, I would like only to show you the difference between the, the multi-robot surgery, where on the uh, bottom left, there is the, um, all the uh, hardware and the software, sorry, all the hardware and software that are needed by the surgeon, the, the assistant surgeon. And then uh, this is the solo surgery platform where you see this part disappear because uh, now it's SARAS that uh, controls directly the, um, the arms. So to design this uh, co very complex control architecture, we have to, as I said, uh, understand uh, in an engineering way, the medical knowledge, then uh, we have to develop uh, all the action uh, and uh, phase recognition and prediction subsystem. Then we have to design the supervisory controller that exploits uh, this information and makes, and makes a decision. Then uh, we have uh, the multi-robot cooperation system that uh, allows the two robots that SARAS is controlling to cooperate to execute in the proper way the, uh, the task. 
Then we have the, the planner that actually decide how and where and when move the uh, robotics arm. And then uh, we send uh, the desired trajectory to the low level controller at, uh, of the robot. And uh, at the very center of this uh, architecture, there is the surgeon, because this uh, architecture, so the SARA system, is not going to perform uh, uh, surgery uh, fully autonomously, but uh, uh, SARAS uh, has to support the main, surgeon, the main surgeon over the procedure. So SARAS has to react to the behavior of uh, uh, the surgeon. So this is just a sketch of the, uh, the, the architecture, just to show you how complex it is to put uh, everything together. So we have to include uh, the SARAS preoperative uh, uh, information, so medical knowledge, uh, the training from previous uh, uh, procedure, uh, uh, the 3D model of the patient, for example, an um, MRI scan. Then uh, we have uh, all uh, the, uh, the anatomical model of uh, uh, the patient. So, uh, and this model should be updated at runtime time because uh, during the procedure, the, the anatomical, uh, uh, I mean, the environment is changing. So we have to update the 3D model in order to uh, design in a better way all the uh, region that SARAS has not to touch. So what are called the um, no-fly zone or forbidden region. Then we have the uh, SARAS AI system. So as you can see here in yellow, the phase segmentation module, the phase prediction, the action recognition, the ac action prediction, tool detection, tool tracking, scene understanding, and also the speech recognition, because we want also to react to uh, surgeon voice. And then we have, uh, last but not, uh, not least, the supervisory system. So uh, the control, the decision-making system, the multi-robot coordination, and the low-level controller. So uh, the data set that we are talking about today uh, refer to real intervention of a prostatectomy. So I would like uh, to point out that, uh, uh, I mean, as soon as possible, we will also make available another data set uh, where the, the intervention is no more on uh, patient, real patient, but on mannequins. So we are, in, during this uh, project, we develop very sophisticated phantoms, uh, so mannequins of the human abdomen. And uh, uh, in, with this mannequin, you can really perform uh, uh, the, the most interesting part of the prostatectomy procedure. And also we can uh, uh, decide to include uh, an expected event uh, to test how well our system reacts to this event. And uh, so, as you can imagine, all these uh, uh, the action recognition, action prediction is uh, very important to design a reliable system to perform a specific task in an autonomous way. So that is the reason for which uh, uh, the consortium of SARAS is uh, very interesting in this, uh, uh, in this challenge because uh, we like to uh, integrate in our system the most, uh, uh, I mean, the better performing uh, detector. So you can follow us uh, uh, our website. Uh, in the website, there is also all the link to Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn and our uh, YouTube uh, channel. I think that uh, this is enough uh, from my side. Uh, the goal here was just to give you uh, an overview of what SARS is. Uh, and uh, if you have any question or curiosity about the project, uh, please, uh, I mean, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ricardo. Uh, you you kind of stole my thunder a little bit because I was going to mention at the end that we do plan, as you said, to extend um, this data set in various ways and challenge. So, in one way, is one main way is to add various other videos. I think we have seven videos so far um, captured on phantoms, so on three D printed anatomies to increase the variability of appearance and so on, and possibly better describe the difference in style across different surgeons. So 
I'm going to mention a little bit this at the end uh, in my closing remarks. Sorry to have spoiled your, <laughs> your okay. final it's, remark. <laughs> it's, it's, good. it's good to repeat things multiple times anyway, so the message gets through. Mm. Are there any questions on uh, Ricardo's uh, very informative presentation? Again, don't be shy. Eh? Nobody can see your face anyway. So. <laughs> No? Okay. So okay. then if Quan is here, I'll... Uh, are you here, Quan? Yes, I, I'm here. Do you oh. hear me? Yeah, very well. Thanks okay, for right. joining us. Uh, thanks, thanks for accepting our invitation to speak. Oh, you have a virtual background. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Informative uh, presentation. I do enjoy it. <laughs> thanks so, again. Thanks for, for accepting our invitation. So Quan is going to... Uh, tell us all about uh, challenges in, uh, in uh, computer vision for, for surgical robotics, but he will be more specific uh, in a minute. Sure. Let me see if I can actually share uh, the, um, the screen. Um, do you see a full mode presentation right now? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Um, okay, so let's let's get started. I'm going to put the timer to make sure that I don't go over time. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about challenges related to computer vision in medical robotics. Um, and I'm going to be touching in both areas, both robotics autonomy and also in the part of uh, computer vision and cognitive uh, robotics as well. All right. Again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that they have been done, uh, that they have been doing in the area of uh, medical imaging and robotics, which started with, um, is related to um, the use of non-sterile interaction in the operating room. And this was much before the need of uh, this type of interactions were required. Now they're special needed to make sure that uh, the operating room and hospitals remain totally sterile. This is a system that was developed quite a while ago uh, where uh, the main surgeon can interact with medical imaging um, in the operating room without touching uh, the screen, mouse, or keyboard. So it's totally touchless. This was actually developed back then in 2006 by us. Uh, before the Kinect was in the market. Um, and if you start looking at the uh, changes in surgery, you can you are going to be pretty impressed. If you look at uh, of how surgery has been done in the past, you will see a number of changes. Uh, now, if you look at this painting, and then you compare with the following painting that happened only 10 years after that, you're going to notice a significant change. Can you see the difference between these between these two images? What, what is the thing that strikes you the most? You, you skip the past. I'm not sure that. Ah, <laughs> uh, sorry. So this is this is the second image, and this is the first image. So I don't know if uh, participants here are, are mute or not, but um, but there's the, a lot more people in the first image than in the second image. You know, so right. the, the patient is on a chair. What else? Look at look at at the wear at the clothes. Yeah, they're in plain clothes in the first image. Yeah. Right in the in the you know in the first image they are. They are basically using the same clothes that they use when they go out on the street. You know, people, they, they, you know, dress pretty formally back then. And later on, you see that by then people are wearing these white gowns. Uh, why is that? Because of um, hygiene, hygiene uh, considerations. And they realize that, you know, they need to change, they change clothing 
uh, when they actually dealing with with the patient to avoid the spread of infection. Also, in, you know, if they're wearing white and you see blood splatter or, uh, or you know, or uh, other, uh, you know, two parts or organ, that is very, very distinctive over white. So that was where, you know, really people start taking conscience about this issue of coming up with ways of minimizing the spread of infection and coming up with, you know, a protocols for that. Now, if you look at surgery today, you know, they, they, we are not only talking about the change in clothing and protocols for, a, for a minimizing the spread of, of infection or a, reducing it, but rather making the whole operating room a being autonomous. As, as was saying, the future of medical education is not anymore about blood and guts, but it's bits and bytes. It's really using computing and robotics. And the, by looking at this, if you can really sketch what's going on in the operating room, we are going to see something like this. We have devices everywhere, we have screens everywhere, we have robots. Uh, and yet something is missing, right? And it's missing, you know, the surgeons, the assistants are interacting with machines and are not interacting physically with, with the patient, which, you know, may be a good thing. I don't know. Uh, but this is a reality that you may not be able to escape because you not you don't always have a totally clean environment, a control setting with all these devices. So think that if you need to apply this to an austere setting or a rural scenario, or even the battlefield, right? You cannot move the whole set of these devices into a, an improvised, for example, small a clinic or hospital, right? So there is still, in my opinion, the way, the need to interact physically with the team and with the patients. This is a, a simple picture that demonstrates the interaction, the, the, the physical interaction between assistants and surgeons. In this case, the interaction is happening because there is a surgical instrument transfer between hands, right? So um, there is still significant gaps in where we see surgery today part has to do with the technological challenges of detection recognition uh, of, of intention, which is part of what Sarah's, I guess, is doing in the cognitive side of that. There's, there are operational challenges related to how you perform surgery, right? Not always uh, the things are uh, fully controlled, as I was mentioned. Sometimes you don't really have a control on the light, occlusions, and the state of the tools. Contextual, of course, a, the ideally would like the robot to adapt to how the context changes. Even if you have the anatomy of the patient and you know in advance what the plan is, what type of surgery needs to happen, changes may occur. Those sort of, or sometimes we refer to that to, uh, as complications, surgical complications. You want the system to be able to use contextual information to adapt to those changes. And, the, and there are translational changes which are related to what are the things that you can model very well and what are the things that you cannot model, right? So especially in the SARAS project that was observing that uh, and all the systems that require human interaction, uh, you know, one aspect is how you interact with inert tissue uh, or with a machine, with an autonomous machine. And another question is how you interact with human, right? what to expect. I mean, this is modeling the human behavior is a different, difficult part of, of the problem. So I'm going to talk about how we address the different uh, challenges through a number of projects. Um, and then we're going to, to discuss at what extent we were able to, to address these different questions. So the first question, the first challenge was the nurse which was a robotic assistant uh, to the operating room. Uh, it's really to think of surgery as a, the immense surgeon interacting directly with the patient. This is, for example, trauma surgery. 
and what is the, uh, the capabilities that we have to integrate a robot into the operating room to, to assist the robot. So, um, you know, this is a, ro a project that we started back then in 2012, 2011 actually. And uh, at that time we were looking into a robotic surgery, but actually a surgery performed by a human directly and how we can integrate the robot in assisting to this uh, surgery. So um, one of the aspects that we, uh, that we saw is that a surgical assistance, one of the main tasks of surgical assistance is delivering surgical tools upon request. Um, now, we envision originally this, you know, bulky system where we have an industrial robot Initially, not a surgical robot. We didn't have that those resources yet. We have a, the main surgeon operating a resident, the surgical technician maybe is there. And uh, rather than having the surgical technician delivering the surgical instruments, we have these robotic scrub nurse. And uh, still, we may want the help of the surgical technicians in case of complications, or to perform a, num a number of other tasks that are more complicated. Um, now. You can see that in the SARAS project, some of these tasks are actually performed autonomously. But uh, back then we focused on a much simpler scenario, which was we delivering surgical instruments. And we wanted to be able to recognize um, a, a verbal requests as nonverbal requests. In terms of nonverbal requests, the most common ways of communicating the surgeon and the surgical assistant as, is using a hand signals you know, certain signals to request for scissors, forceps, um, and different tools, uh, and the uh, spoken request, the speech, right, you know, request to, uh, in, to explicitly ask for other tools. So we wanted really to create, to come up with this uh, system, this robotic nurse that understands multimodal requests. And we came up with a simple classifier, back then a head Marco model worked pretty well to recognize a hand signals. A, for, a, you see a, about a 10, a 10 surgical instruments, almost 96 recognition accuracy. And all this was, you know, assuming that of course, we know in advance where the surgical instruments are, you know, there was a fixed separation between the instruments. The robot could see the instruments and plan the grasping and the trajectory. And all that worked well, of course, as you can see, the more instruments are overlap, the more difficult for the system and for the robot is to grasp. As you can see, that, you can see that as the instruments are closer and closer, the uh, success in terms of delivering the, the instruments and actually grasping decays significantly, right? And then, you know, you cannot, um, so let me first show a little uh, demo of the system, how the system was working uh, then uh, with the first prototype. So you see this industrial robot was very shaky, uh, was fast, we wanted to make sure that we match the speed of the assistant. Some of the requests as you see are performed using hand signals only and some of them spoken commands, okay. Um, now um, this, this work was featuring communications of the ACM back then and attracted a lot of uh, attention. We've all seen the side um, movies where robots are ready to take over the world. Here at Purdue University, they're working on real life scenarios like Baxter, the human like robot. Engineering and technology students are working to put Baxter in the OR to help. So you didn't take over the world then? 
Not, not, it didn't in the end. So we experiment, as you see, with different uh, platforms. We, we, we experimented with dual arms, we experimented with one robots, we experimented with FP2 robots back then as well. Um, and yes, on the side note, of course, nurses contact us and we're pretty concerned that, you know, the robots want to, to take their, uh, their jobs and even uh, NPR, National Public Radio, which is a very popular show here, very popular uh, radio network, you know, cover this work uh, in the context of whether, you know, robots are going to take over and, and displace, uh, you know, a, a person. Train personnel in their jobs, but as I said, there is still challenges and tasks that we rely on humans uh, to do. Um, but let me just look at how the reality looks like. You know, we kind of work in a very nice blue sky scenario, but when you see the reality of surgery, you see that things are quite different. Um, instruments are not located one close to the other. Uh, on fixed increments. This is how the operating room looks like. This is how the instruments look like. We are quite good on picking instruments in this context. As you see, the robot in a much simpler scenario wasn't able to be effective with that. So how we actually deal with this problem? Well, it turns out a lot of computer vision and grasping challenges. Um, but I'm going to claim that those are solvable. Uh, with enough work, enough technical work and research, you can deal with some of those problems. You know, you can do some uh, fancy computer vision uh, and uh, pattern recognition techniques to recognize the different tools, the position orientations, uh, the instrument, the tool tip, or the, the end effector of the, of the robot and being able to adapt that to the orientation of the instrument and be able to use all time, all type actuation to be able to grasp the instrument, for example, magnetic, electromagnetic force. And we were able to succeed pretty well dealing with this problem. But there are problems that are much more difficult to, to address. Uh, for example, how what, you know what is the intention of the surgeon? And sometimes we refer to the nurses as mind readers because they may know what the main surgeon wants before the surgeon knows himself. In this case, the surgeon, you know, wants to read his mind and knows that he needs scissor. And she probably, if, you know, if they have been working for a while, she probably will do a very good job. Now, of course, having the robot able to do this is quite challenging. And we realized that what we need to do is to come up with some type of multimodal sensing to be able to see if we can predict the needs of a surgeon by his uh, behavior, his body pose, his signals, his, um, you know, uh, electrical, uh, electroencephalographic signals, the emails indicating brain activity that may be also an indication of intention, right? So we fuse all these sensor, sensor modalities to be able to predict uh, whether there is a specific request. Um, we were able to come up with a very good solution about what instrument is needed based on modeling the surgery. It was much more challenging to know when the main surgeon needed the instrument. So we come up with an interesting architecture which involved fusing all these modalities um, using a feature selection, some interesting machine learning. But the key, the key interesting uh, finding was we came up with a, a, a new architecture for a spiking neural networks to be able to come up with a solution for turn taking. So turn taking is really realized at what point is the turn of the nurse and at what point is the turn of the surgeon. Um, I'm not going to have time to cover this spiking neural network, but it's quite an interesting work that has been published. And I can show an interesting solution for this. And when we compare how this turn taking was working with respect to other technologies, uh, suggested for turn taking, we actually were able to come up with 
with a, a, an excellent performance uh, to predict intention, um, you know, up to 40% of the beginning, from the beginning of the previous term. That means that uh, you know, before the, uh, the, the new term started, basically a uh, 60% if you want, or, or uh, before that term started, we were able to predict quite accurately up to 85% accuracy what was the intention. And you see that as the term was finishing, human performance is what we see here in yellow, Humans actually are better predicting, nurses, for example, predicting what is going to be when the, the instrument, what instrument and when the instrument is going to be required. So bottom line, we are quite, we are much better as, you know, as a machine predicting when the instrument is going to be required early in the term. And the longer that we wait, uh, the humans are actually better in that prediction. And it's quite uh, fine. Uh, here you can see a demo of this multimodal system uh, where the surgeon is wearing all these uh, physiological uh, sensors and we have optical sensors as well and EMG sensors to be able to predict the need of the surgeon. All right, let's move to the, to the next project. This, this is very interesting. We, we also do work on, on early prediction. Um, two years ago, the same year as you in 2018, we published a paper called Predicting Action Tubes, which is, was about really early action anticipation. And we had a similar graph uh, um, to the one that you just showed. Um, so one, one possible extension to this challenge in the future is, uh, is to extend it to prediction tasks. So not just recognizing, not just testing system, recognize the actions in real time, but also testing the ability to predict future, future actions. Yes, yes. This goes a little bit ahead of time in the sense that when we talk about the previous term, you can think of now we are in the current term, and we are 10, 20 percent of that turn to be over, and we are now predicting what's going to happen next. So you can look at those, of course, and I would love to look at what you guys did. And it seems that for several, you are also right now looking at intention, because every time that you work with a human operator, you need to know what the intention is, what's going to happen next. So this is essential, and I would love to, to hear more about that. We, we are, we are in fact, yes. So yes. This is very, very interesting. Um, you Let's know, have a conversation offline maybe on this. Please, please, please. please. Um, so to wrap up, uh, we propose uh, some algorithms related uh, recognition of instrument grasping segmentation. Uh, but as I said, that was a quite interesting challenge. That was not the largest challenge. The largest challenge was to really come up with early turn taking prediction. And when I say early turn taking prediction, means being able to say uh, when it's going to happen, what the turn is going to be, and what the turn is going to be early on. Okay, not once the turn started, because then it's already too late. Um, and actually, humans are better doing that. Okay. And we, we evaluated the system in the, in the chest tunnels project and, and worked pretty well. So let me talk about the next uh, project that we are still working, which is um, take out the robot from the operating room, which works pretty well right now, and put that robot in the battlefield. Now, it doesn't really have to be the battlefield. It has to be the idea is to take the robot or take search in any place which are still you know, rural surgery is still performing a surgical procedure in a clinic, in a remote clinic, in a field clinic is austere. A performing a, a life-saving skill on, you know, on a recovery, uh, and, you know, disaster recovery mission is austere. All that is austere. And, you know, those, those, 
posterior stuff the bladder. But sometimes you don't have the medical problem that you need. You know, so the vision that we have is to have this mobile robot and that can go to the right away to the injury. Now, you know, you don't, the, the casualty doesn't really have to be on the field. You can think of the casualty being inside a vehicle. Of course, that is most likely to happen on a safe area. area. But being able to treat the patient within the golden hour. So now there's a lot of challenges to this problem. Part of this problem is that we have a lot of data from the surgical scenario, from the operating room, uh, and most of the data is using the Da Vinci. But we have very little data uh, in a, what a, is related to auspice settings or, or, you know, or the field. Why? Because we don't really have good robots to perform procedures in the field. And the few robots that are there, we don't really have data collected from them. In fact, we don't almost have data collected from real surgeons, from medics performing life skills, saving skills on, on the field. Um, that data is scarce and is extremely valuable. So the key question here is, what can we learn from the data that we have that can be extrapolated to new environments, new settings? New settings means, uh, you know, from the operating room to the field, from a Da Vinci to another uh, dual arm robot, from a laparoscopy, you know, a colectomy, for example, to a, you know, a laparotomy in the field, what is the transferability of, of the knowledge that we can do here? So what we did was to, first of all, come with this uh, platform. We are um, an expert. We will teleoperate this robot. Um, but this expert, rather than use, use a simulation, a simulation that is very close to what really is happening, but will allow the surgeon to decouple from the feed, from the real-time feed, therefore avoiding delays, will perform the procedure. Those procedures will be recognized in terms of basic action units, called those action units surgeons. The surgeons are going to recognize as high-level knowledge sent in a compact manner to a remote robot. The remote robot will decode this high-level knowledge using the context in the field. So there is some AI going on here because the robot needs to figure out what's going on and how to make sense of these surgeons. Um, and because we don't really know what will be, how it, what it's going to look like, we really wanted to create this skills library that is learned from different type of robots, from different type of conditions, and be able to transfer that to different type of robots and conditions. So we created the desk data set, where we have multiple type of robots, we have the torus robot, we have a simulator of the torus, we have the Yami, we have currently the Da Vinci as well, we have simulated version of each of these robots. And we collected, uh, we look into one simple procedure, which, which is the peg and pole transfer. We said, if, if we cannot do that procedure successfully, we're not going to do, to do anything successfully. Now, peg and pole transfer is one of the basic fundamentals of a laparoscopy. So we think that it's an important task. And we collected a lot of data uh, for this simple task from different robots. And the question is, can we, what can we learn from this data and what we can learn from this data? Okay, so, and this data was segmented, this procedure was segmented uh, into surgeons. Again, surgeons are these basic action units of uh, surgical tasks. Okay, so we have a simulated environment. Now, um, now that we have also simulation, we can also speculate on if you have a simulation, you can actually very easily augment the amount of data. So how much real data 
we need and how much can be simulated to be able to transfer the skill effectively. So we want to have this combination of real data, which we know that it's very limited because we don't have data almost from the from austere scenarios. We can simulate a lot of that data. We're going to combine that, okay? We're going to train a, a, a machine learning algorithm and we're going to see at what extent we can get rid of the real data or use the minimum that we can, the necessary minimum, and maximize the simulation to keep good performance. So we explore, ex, uh, explore these different type of scenarios, different type of robots. Uh, we conducted this task and created features, which included kinematic features and visual features. These are only the kinematic, as you see where we use a window of uh, overlapping windows and within the windows we concatenated the trajectories uh, the kinematic information of the two tips resampled information send that to a supervised machine learning algorithm and try to predict the search yields in this case for the pig and pole transfer we are relying on seven search yields okay now we can come up with a this is the kinematic representation of the data, we can come up with a similar approach for the visual data that can be applied for simulation or for real uh, images. And we have this uh, compact representation of kinematic and visual information, which we can combine uh, with a simple formula and come up with a final prediction of the search unit. Oh. Okay, I know that I already mean it, so I'm going to try to speed up. Um, all right, so this is what we found. We found that combining kinematic and visual does better than just kinematic, not much better. It seems that most of the information is coming from the kinematic data, okay? And here we also look at what is the percentage of real data that we need in order to do well okay so we really want to minimize as i told you the, the amount of real data that we need and use as much as we can simulated data um here you can see for example um the amount of kinematic and visual data that we have okay and a, the percentage of real data that we use so now you see that with only, with only artificial data, our performance of record is very low. In this case, uh, in the best case, it's 33% accuracy. That's quite bad uh, using simulation uh, to try to predict a execution on a real Taurus robot. And here is using simulation and trying to predict on a Yami robot. And as you see, the larger the percentage of real data we have, the better we perform. You can see here with only 10% of real data, we are able to perform almost at 80%, uh, sorry, at 82% accuracy, okay? And with the other different type of robot, we are at 73, which is not as good, but, but yet this is quite an amazing uh, finding. That means that the transferability of this simulation to a real setting is, is quite good. All right, so this is the last part I'm going to, to wrap up. We were trying to predict the different action unit or tasks. We are able to predict the search use. There is the question of at what extent we can autonomously perform a whole procedure. So we asked that question using imitation learning. And at what extent we can use virtual reality or virtual data, uh, artificial data, to be able to perform this task successfully. So we look into this, we collect a lot of data from uh, virtual uh, demonstrations. We process this data set using a unified, unified robot space. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. We look at performance metrics and then, um, and, um, and of course, for, sorry, for classification, we look into um, a neural network as well. Um, in order to be able to adapt our robot, we come up with a very cheap solution 
Uh, we didn't have anything fun, uh, fancy, so we said, okay, can we print 3D print tooltips or any effectors uh, that we can adapt to an industrial robot to convert that to a semi semi surgical robot? So we did 3D printed these different tooltips to be able to perform uh, the peg and pole transfer and a debridement task. Um, all right, so peg and pole transfer, we did talk about that. Uh, fundamentals of, la, of uh, laparoscopy. Um, you see here an example using our virtual environment, the, the VREP. Uh, in this case, we have actually seven surgeons, as you can see. Uh, for every peg and pole transfer, we have a start position and end position. Uh, for the breathing task, we have five surgeons, and the idea here is to remove deceased necrotic tissue from healthy areas. Okay, and that involves a uh, five surgeons where we need to remove this tissue to a different target location. Um, the way that the operator works, he works with a Vive uh, headset. This is the view that actually the operator had when performing the different tasks. Um, all right, we collected data from trajectories which uh, involve uh, observations. The observations had the state of the robot and the state of the, of the environment. Of, of course, the state of the robot described the state of the end effector, uh, all the positions and the environment describe information that we can get in reality through computer vision and in simulation, we know this information is the position of the target and uh, the object that we want to, to transfer. All right. So we use deep imitation learning. We look at trajectories uh, that were collected at uh, 20 hertz. We realized that there are different ways of augmenting this data. We to augment this data is to sample the given trajectories performed by humans uh, at a fixed sample rate where we extract a frame every other time or every number of times and therefore, we can create slightly different, trans uh, different versions of the trajectory. We can also take the trajectory and apply transformations while keeping the same goal, uh, the same target and initial position. So in this way, we can really work nice with uh, this uh, virtual environment and generate thousands, hundreds of thousands of observations to train our system. So <clears throat> we have our observations. We use stack LSTMs to train the system, and we try to predict the next action based on that. The next action is going to be the state of the robot. We move, we execute that, feed that back to the uh, LSTM and predict the next one. So this is sequentially sequential procedure. Uh, we realize that the performance is not so good. So one solution that we found is that we realized that we may need to transform this every surgeon basically to have um, to be mapped to the same coordinate uh, frame, uh, to the same frame of coordinates. So the way to do that is to learn the transformation, minimizing the, the error between uh, the, the, the transformation between these two uh, reference frames and learn this transformation in this case for the simple scenario would be an affine transformation um, if for every surgeon okay map the transformation to the same frame of coordinates uh, execute the task uh, pre predict the task execute and then convert back so we're going to to skip that, this was the original demonstrations. They were a map to the new coordinate frame, fed to the robot executed, uh, and then map back to the coordinate frame of the user, okay? And once we use this little, this is kind of a trick that worked pretty well, we found out yet that the, the performance is not as good as we would like. We found that our success rate for the whole task is 59%. Again, here we're not predicting the surgeons or executing the surgeons, we're executing the full task, okay? Where human demonstrations, 
for a naive user, it took about 79% accuracy to, to complete the whole task as well. Uh, to refer, every time that the user dropped the peg, we call that a failure, okay? Right here, examples of the failures. We look into um, the different performance of the sulchims. You see, the sulchims are already measured, but of course, if you have a sequence of seven sulchims and the last sulchim, for example, line and days, it's uh, not successfully executed, then the task is, the full task is not really executed. Okay. And therefore, it doesn't matter how well part of the execution, then the whole task is either failure. So this is an interesting result. For the debridement task, we got a 90% Sorry, Juan, you, you broke up. Um, you still there? Yes, it, I was sorry. It's that I, I was muted somehow. I think it's. Uh, it was. I think we we had to wrap up anyway because we. We're going to yes. That is just the end of it. Um, just let me thirty seconds and that's it. Okay. Um, so we did better in terms of a uh, search recognition. We did we did quite good, uh, as you can see, almost one hundred percent recognition. None of them. Uh, we also measure economy of motion we realize that in terms of economy of motion, we do better than the experts. Economy of motion is based on the path length of the execution. Um, so the, the path length was shorter for the robot. Task completion time, we didn't do better. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that, but part of that has to do with the protocol to communicate with the robot. So we elaborate more in this on a publication. Um, let me wrap up. Uh, we came up with a, a nice way of do task automation from human demonstration. We did that in two different surgical tasks using simulation. Good results for the breedment, not so good results for peg pole transfer, but better economy of motion uh, than humans. So to wrap up, technological challenges, a lot of them can be solved with new hardware and sensors Everybody is nowadays using GPUs for training effectively neural networks. There are operational challenges that we still need to, to deal with, which is how to transfer from a controlled domain to an uncontrolled domain. There's the human factor side, which is how you model the human. Still, people do unpredictable things. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we realize that it seems that the ideological system will be some more hybrid between the human and the robot. Well, thank you so much. These are the sponsors of the work and I appreciate your time and your patience. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Juan. Actually, it was super interesting that there are so many different things I would like to, to talk to you about. Uh, again, maybe we can continue offline. So one thing is, I don't know what VIVEC uh, instructions were, but I think it would be nice to have everybody uh, sending their presentations to slides to VVEC so we can upload them on the on the challenge website. And right, away, no problem. And uh, if separately, you could could you send this paper to to me because uh, obviously one thing I wanted to say is that we have decision making problems as well. And one thing I want to explore was imitation learning, but it seems like you you have already done that and you've learned quite a lot. Uh, in that respect, so I think it would be great for for me and Ina. I think uh, that is the, the the person in charge of uh, decision making for Sadas would be very interesting read. Um, and then might, we might come back to you with some with some feedback on questions if you don't mind. I one, would love that. Sure. Uh, one one question I wanted to ask you is I have also been reading about uh, spike spike neural networks uh, recently because. Um, we have a group that does cognitive robotics here, and I find it very interesting because it's, slightly, it's a completely different approach from classical machine learning one. So I was wondering, 
were you able to compare like a classical machine learning method with its spike neural networks and see which is the best performer? Because it, when they when you read like cognitive robotics papers, they don't really do any of these sort of comparisons, right? They just say, I tried this. No. You know, in a limited simulation environment and they, they show some response patterns, but they don't really compare performance in the way that people in machine learning do. Right. See, we did some comparison in terms of uh, the turn, and it's in the slide, in terms of how early we can predict the turn taking. And we compared with uh, hidden Marco models, BTW, the LSTM, uh, and Ishii approach, we named that by the name of the, by the author of the paper, which is one prominent person in the area of turn taking. Um, and TTSnet, which is another, uh, deep, um, let me see, the TTSnet is the traditional turn taking uh, spiking, it's our turn taking spiking neural network, okay? It's the one, the version that we create. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you and the SNN is the traditional spiking neural network. So we compete, so the only one that we competed, which is considered deep learning, if you want, is an LSTM. Okay, or at least is considered, you know, the new yeah. trend of, of, of learning, of machine learning. And we, you see, the LSTM did quite well, but, uh, and it was consequently doing quite well, in fact, better than all the others, but not better than ours and not better than human, uh, better than human below 30% of prediction of the turn taking. In fact, you can see that for a while, um, let me see, the LSTM, no, the LSTM was very early the best in before 10% of the of mm -hmm. the prediction. He was, we were able to predict with 70% accuracy and LSTM was the best performer. But then a spike in neural network worked better. So depends a lot on the task that you're trying to solve. You know, for traditional challenges, we found that deep neural network uh, techniques work much better. Mm -hmm. um, we were interested in this technique when it comes to really cognitive um, task that is very human-like. In this case, we are looking into this prediction that we do very well of when is your turn. Seems to be something that is very, human kind. Yeah. So we thought that this a cognitive inspired approach will work well. And a, but I have to say that we tried that a, this technique on other machine learning problems and we seldom see that it, it, it surpass uh, deep neural networks. Deep networks. It, That's very it interesting. It works very well in very specific I would like to see it's more of those uh, empirical comparisons because the two communities are quite disjoint and and they speak in a different language as well. The, the structure of the papers is different. So I really would like to see more of those uh, cross cross uh, field comparisons. So thanks, uh, thanks, Juan, again. Um, are there any other questions for, for Juan before we move on to the participate, participating team's presentations? Again, don't feel shy. Uh, so I would like to suggest that we have the first presentation and then we have our break immediately uh, rather than wait for the second presentation because we've been running a bit late so and people might be a bit tired. So um, I will leave it to Vivek to introduce uh, the various teams. I will have the first presentation and then the 15 minute break and then we continue with the other three presentations. Is that okay? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Just go ahead, uh, Vivek, and take charge of introducing the teams. Yeah. So the next uh, presentation is from Vivian from Harvard Institute of Technology. Are you here? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, should I open the video? Yeah, uh, share your screen and then and start. Okay. 
share my screen. It's usually um, at, the, at the bottom, if you scroll down towards the yeah. bottom of the of the screen of the window, you should. I have to click now. I'm uh, sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I will. I will rejoin you. Uh, let's begin. Hello, everyone. My name is Zhang Shi, and I come from Perceptual Computing Research Center. Harbin Institute of Technology, China. It is a great honor for me to take this report today, though we can only see each other via the internet. The key role in our team is Peng Fei Zhao and Professor Wang and Mr. Law are our supervisors. I'm so proud that our team got the first place in this competition. And on behalf of our team, I'd like to share our solution with all of you. I will mainly introduce from the following three aspects, dataset, methodology, and the results. Firstly, we noticed that the dataset is extremely unbalanced distributed. For example, the smallest ratio between training set and the test set is only 0 0.49, while the biggest ratio can almost reach 40. We can also observe this phenomenon more intuitively through the histogram on the right side. So it is easy for us to reach the following information. The number of each category varies greatly. Unbalanced dataset portion and the data volume of individual categories is too small to overfit in the period of training. Then we made a further analysis about the dataset. Label ambiguity is another important feature. That is to say, the organs do not hold a fixed shape in comparison to the task of human activity detection. And there is very little contextual information. As a result of which, it is unable to show complete organs. What's more, the label content of different action categories is so similar that sometimes it is difficult for a narrow network to distinguish between them. Aiming at the problems mentioned above, we promoted an effective solution in that we added the validation set to the training set and we rebuilt all the data set, which made the score increased by 0 0.7. Secondly, as for the methodology, we adopt a faster RCNN as a detection framework. We extract free, uh, feature maps through the backbone network, and then we use FBN to multi-scale fusion of features. Region proposal network serves as provi providing various bounding boxes, through which we can get the category of each pixel as well as the coordinates of the regression target boxes. As a process of ROI outline, we reached our final results. Now, as we can see, the deformable convolution, which is able to capture the key discriminal information, we know that formal grid sampling in standard convolution is a culprit that makes CNN difficult to adapt geometric deformation. 
As is known on the right picture, the receptive fields of CNN during training can include both surgical tools and the human structure. Such method only adds a small amount of model complexity and the calculation, but significantly improves the, the cognition accuracy. We also adapt GCNet as a global context modeling framework. For instance, if we want to recognize a person, we may need to look at the entire face to recognize him. Supposing you are just given a piece of skin of your face or separate nose. It's, it is relatively difficult to recognize him. Choosing that is, a, is equivalent to an attention mechanism. The information of a single pixel on the map is relatively separate. This network is supplemented by pixel information at, an, at other locations on the picture. Thirdly, when we are going to design anchor sizes, we first made a size statistics as is shown in the sc scatter plots. We assign a cluster center to the length and width of each category's anchors. And after continuous updating, we got the final cluster center as a reference size of anchors. By the way, this kind of trick can be used in many other situations, such as vehicles and the pedestrian detection. This page shows another trick of our solution, which is that we cut out insignificant ages, ages before sending pictures into the neural network, remaining only important information. And after the training, we have to paste the black edges to the corresponding position according to the coordinates. The last very useful method is that we use VBox Jitter to improve the generali generalization ability. We know that sometimes there are certain errors in manual labeling, so in order to enhance the rapid robustness of the detection network. We set the hyperparameter to 0 .9, 0 0.9 to 1.1, which not only changed the position of the anchors, but also changed the shape of the anchors. Some other tricks, such as mixed precision training, random cropping, and multi-scale testing or training, can be places where the score, scores improves. But I think the most important thing is to go back to the data set itself for analysis. Finally, finally, these two pictures are part of our result and the leaderboard shows our final ranking. That's all the solution in our project. Thank you for your listening. Is there any questions? Hello? Yeah. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you for your presentation. There's a, I have one question. It sounds like you have used, uh, how do you call it, deformable C convolution yeah um, formable convolution yes is the is the shape of the convolution window learned or is it uh, set by you and uh, uh, no 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 Th this picture is not the original ones uh, the the shape of the kernels is learned by the neural network not de not designed by myself right that's what i thought but it wasn't it wasn't so clear from your slides so it is learned by the network yeah
And I didn't quite understand how do you capture contextual information. So that that, yeah. yeah, this part here. So yeah. so are you looking are you looking at a distribution of pixels um, at some relative location from the from the window? What is it that you're doing here? And I'm sorry, could you please repeat so your where, How do you decide where do you extract the contextual information within the image? Mm, let me see. Do you learn, do you learn also where to extract uh, contextual information um, with using these parameters W that you show in your formula? I mean, uh, let me let me just reformulate. So you 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 can extract information from anywhere in the image, right? Yeah. So how do you decide? Do you make the network learn where to look? Oh, uh, where, where, where to look? Hmm. Well, it doesn't matter. We can discuss it offline. Don't worry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, anyway. Uh, okay, should we take a break? Yeah, I would say let's let's take a break now for fifteen minutes, and then uh, we'll resume for the second team. Yeah. Okay. That's okay with everybody. Yes, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Then I think we can meet again at seven. Oh, sorry, four oh eight. And then in time. Four ten. Yeah, ten plus four. Four, four ten. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Four ten. Just stay yeah. stay in the sessions. So don't close the session just in case. Uh, yes, we will. I am there. Should we continue yeah. with the uh, team presentations? Uh, yes, we will. Uh, is next pa participant here? Shen Zhao? Yes. So, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. May I share my screen? Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Shang Zhao. I'm a PhD student uh, in the department of George Washington, Univers uh, George Washington University. Today I will present our approach for the Sarah's ESET challenge. The title of my presentation is Enhancing Surgeon Action Detection with Split Attention. First, I'd like to thank the organizer of the contest for providing this precious labeled dataset. Surgery is a challenging medical procedure, which may cause adverse uh, events, and therefore, it is important to make the surgery safer uh, by developing an automated sur uh, surgical assistant. The necessity to identify what surgeon is doing by observing his movements will rise in all surgical tasks where the robot uh, is expected to assess, uh, assist the surgeons. 
the first step toward is the automated uh, uh, assistant in action detection. ESET challenge indicates two primary objectives, which are the surgical action classification and the localization. These two objectives correspond to the object detection and image classification in the computer vision community, respectively. As the success of the convolutional neural network in this field in recent years, we apply a, a, we propose a attention-based CNN to meet the challenge. Though the object detection and the image classification have achieved a significant improvement with deep learning, the surgeon action detection is still a challenging problem. By glazing at the data examples, one can intuitively tell the discrepancies of surgical images and the nature images. In the ESET contest, we are in the fourth to the uh, sixth place of MAP and the runner-up team of the AP50. So in the following slides, I will explain our method of the second place AP50 in the challenge. We first made some observations on the data set by visualizing the class distributions. The first impression of these pie charts is the imbalanced number of samples in the classes. It's common in surgical data sets because surgeon action of primary tasks takes much more time to complete than other ones during the procedure. This implies that we have to consider the compensation of the huge imbalance of classes in designing machine learning algorithms. The second observation is the images are always high resolutions. A rule of thumb in this situation is resizing the image before passing them into CNNs. The input size of the image can be an important parameter which correlates to the architecture of CNN, especially the depth of the network. So we consider the size of the input image as a priority when turning the training parameters. In addition, most of the images have high complexity which contain multiple actions. Moreover, the categories of labels are fine grained which lead to the difficulty of distinguishing similar actions. For example, there are four types of clipping, six types of cutting, five types of pulling. Categorizing these actions can be challenging. Another characteristic is that the data, surgical data involve many interactions between the tissues and surgical instruments, which is rare to other object detection problems. Other uncontrolled variables also cause difficulties to action detection, such as the variation of the illumination, different view angles, and the occlusions of surgical instruments. Based on our observation of the surgical data, CNN is a must-have option. We'd like to thank the uh, uh, contest organizer again for providing a high-quality baseline code, which allows us to focus on the model design. Following the baseline method, a feature pyramid top-down architecture with lateral connections is developed for building high-level semantic feature maps at all scales. To this backbone, Retina net uh, attaches two sub-networks, one for classifying anchor boxes and one for regressing from anchor boxes to ground truth object boxes. This design can reduce the accuracy gap between our one-stage detector and the state-of-art two-stage uh, two detectors. A constant in deep learning community is that good feature representation play key roles in machine learning problems. Thus, we start by looking for a backbone that has better representation power. The baseline uses a ResNet as the backbone. It is well known by the bypass link that allows the gradient to backpropagate along the network without degradation. Therefore, it supports very deep neural network. Besides the depth of networks, cardinality and attention are other two key factors that affect the representation power of the model. The combination of attention or its variation to CNN in recent works has been shown better performance in different benchmark datasets, such as MS Coco. Thus, we start by integrating the attention mechanisms into CNN models. Attention is interpreted as a weighted sum, which is analogous to the human vision system by focusing on important features and suppressing unnecessary ones. This technique originated from natural language processing, 
which has been widely applied to image classification and object detection in computer vision. The first attention mechanism we tried is the convolutional block attention module. The CBM is the concatenation of channel attention module and spatial attention module. CBM emphasizes meaningful features along those two principal, uh, principal dimensions. Each of the branches can learn what and where to attend in the channel and spatial axis respectively. The attention integrated ResNet block can be considered as a combination of ResNet and CBAM. The second module we tried is ResNest that improves ResNet by integrating attention and cardinality. Because ResNet has limited res receptive field size and lacks cross channel interactions, these two figures illustrate the computational operations in a ResNest block. The figure on the right hand side shows the computational details of the attention weights. The main idea of ResNet is to divide, uh, divide the feature map into groups along the channel dimension and the final grand subgroups or splits where the feature representation of each group is determined via a weighted combination of representations of its slip, uh, slips. In the ResNet blocks, the feature can be divided into several feature map groups. The resulting feature map groups are referred as cardinal groups. In addition, the radix is referred to as the split within a, car a cardinal group. The split attention module integrates the information from the radix to generate a probability distribution by the softmax operation. This probability is then used as the soft assignment weights of the split attention. According to the literature, ResNest outperforms the ResNet backbone in various CV tasks. And it achieves state-of-the-art performance in object detection by transferring the backbone from the image net tasks. However, the cost is an overhead of numbers of parameters and the G-flows, uh, but in an acceptable range. For the choice of loss function, we explore two options. The first one is focal loss. It is proposed to address the class imbalance by downweighting the well-classified uh, samples. In other words, if a sample had high estimate confidence, the importance of this sample is reduced. So the training focus on the samples that are uncertain. Our second option is the, uh, the multi-box loss. This loss function consists of two parts. The first part is the smooth L1 loss of bounding box locations. And the second one, uh, is the sum of the true positive and the true negative NLL of the classification confidence. Comparing to the focal loss, M-box uh, -box loss is lacking the capability of compensating the class imbalance. We conducted various experiments based on the mentioned modules and architectures. The obtained results are shown in the following slides. The first result of table focuses on the choice of backbone and the model that generates the submitted results. From the result, the metric of either AP or MAP of CBM were no better than the baseline ResNet. So we gave, uh, so we gave up this backbone. For the second configuration, ResNet has shown better performance than CBM, but we found that the training with and without validation set seem to be have opposite trends. For example, the MAP decreases when the depth of the network increases when training includes the validation set. In contrast, the trend, the trend of MAP turns increasing when the training includes the validation set. This is the first time that we observed this phenomenon. After submitting uh, several testing results, we found that the results of training with the validation set have better indication. In addition, we conducted experiments to find out the proper input image size and loss functions. We selected the image resolution with 200, 400, and 600. Both focal loss and multi-box loss were tested. As we expected, the focal loss did a better job because because of its cap uh, capacity of handling the imbalanced classes. The other observation from these experiments is that the results of validation set has a similar trend as the previous slides. That is, 
the performance of the network on the validation set keeps growing with the size of the input image increases. However, the story of the test set is not the case. A similar phenomenon is observed by authors of ESET paper, and now we have similar observations on the other loss functions. To explain the gap between the validation and the test set, we draw similar pie graphs in previous slides, but put more cases together to compare. These figures illustrate the class distribution of different set configurations. One can see that the observable differences is, deep, uh, is between validation and test set among these figures. By contrast, the differences between the training set, a training plus validation set, and test set are neglectable. This observation could be an explanation of the phenomenon that occurs in our experiments. Therefore, we choose uh, which was a training plus validation set in the following experiments that validate hyperparameters. Except the backbone, loss function, hyperparameters that we discussed, we also validate a, uh, the model by configuring more hyperparameters. Instead of, uh, uh, instead of the growth searching, the control variable stream is used, for, uh, is used to save time. We first set up a reference model as the ResNet 101. Uh, the corresponding parameters are shown on the top of the table. During the experiments, uh, we only change the one hyperparameter at a time. The explored hyperparameters are the number of shared head layers, the number of uh, head layers, batch size, and the type of, of uh, the type of the optimizer. Sadly, we failed to submit a model that is better than our best result on the current leaderboard. It occurs when the batch size is 32. We hope to have the chance to test it on the testing data after releasing the full data set. For the other hyperparameters, the corresponding model did not surpass the reference configuration. So for the conclusion, we drew conclusions from the experience of ESA challenges. First, the split attention of CNN can greatly help for the performance of ESAT. Second, the architecture of the backbone network plays a key role in improving the performance of the model. Third, besides split attention, the depth of the CNN and the size of the input image have great impacts on AP50. And finally, the publication of the data set will greatly help the development of, of automated uh, surgeon assistant. For the future work, we are planning to do more research in the following directions. The sequence of the surgical procedure implies the temporal information in the ESAT task. And dedicate, uh, involving temporal information could potentially facilitate the accuracy of ESAT task. Dedicated data augmentation for surgeon action detection is desired, since the surgical image have unique characteristics comparing to other uh, nature images. And last, uh, the technique that improves the representation power of CNN, such as self-supervised learning, can be used in ESA tasks as well. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you for your very interesting presentation, actually. So uh, I would like to congratulate you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, was very informative. So there were several interesting points. One is the, I mean, the current size of the data set is still limited. So, you know, we only had four videos and I think you, you were, it's very interesting that, that the fact that you point out that the distribution of classes across these videos is very different. So um, that's something that it would be worth elaborating upon in the journal paper we're going to write on this challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And um, also the point you're making about temporal, using temporal information in the future, this is exactly one of the things that we plan to go for for the next edition of the challenge, uh, either here or in Nikai. Um, so moving away from frame level detection to detection of um, so-called action tubes. So fully using the, 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 the dynamic information provided by the sequence. Any, any other questions from, from the participants?
No, so thank you, thank you, Sean, yeah, for your presentation, you. and that's uh, that's uh, the next team. Okay. The next team is Thomas Saka University. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Can I share my screen now? Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Liang Zhi Li. I'm a researcher at Osaka University. And the other team member is a PhD student in our lab. And the title today is the Data and the Backbone Engineering for Edition Detection on Surgical Videos. So let's start with our model. So we are using the same model uh, as the baseline, which is the retina net, because uh, both, um, both I and my teammate, we are beginners at, um, at the object detection task. So we have several experiences several years ago, but recently we didn't know the the the, the recent trend in this area. So uh, we want to start with the baseline and test how far we can go. And uh, there are several there are several aspects in the baseline model we can make make modification. That that is the image, the image part we can do some uh, image engineering and uh, including the augmentation. And we can modify the backbone. I we noticed that other team other teams are also doing many works on the backbone selections. They are for example the first team are using uh, using the uh, deform convolution and the second team are is using the rest nest and we also do a lot of work on the backbone engineering we, we test every possible combination of the backbone networks and the third one and the, and the third part is the neck the, which is the fpn or the ifp uh, of the object detection network and the, the, the last part is the height and in the following slides uh, i will uh, introduce uh, uh, our works in these four uh, parts, uh, one by one. And first, I want to talk about the head. Um, because you know, the, this data set is a temporary data set. So, and this, that is action detection. We have to, we have to formulate the temporary formation. So, we put an LSTM model in an LSTM module in the head, uh, in uh, both in the classification head and also in the localization head. So um, we put two LSTMs, uh, two kind of LSTM modules every head and. Uh, and later we find that there's a paper um, also using the similar uh, solutions, which is uh, this one, named the recurrent retina net. They also use kind of STM in their head. And we found that the, you know, the baseline model used 256 as the channel number for the head, but we found that it's too much for the, uh, LSTM because LSTM usually need um, uh, a much larger memory and a much la much larger computation cost. So we decrease the channel number to the half or maybe to the uh, to the quarter. I forget. And uh, so the memory can be mm, can also be halved. And the second part is about the net. Actually, we are using a most recent, a, a most uh, a new method named the titles from a most recent paper. Actually, this this uh, object, uh, this network is the SOTA model now, and we found it. it it, we find it, it is very powerful on other data sets. So what we want to use several ideas from this network 
to enhance the our uh, enhance the optimization of our model. And the first uh, and the first part is the F um, to change the FPN into the IP uh, IFP. Uh, FPN means the feature pyramid network. And IFP means recursive feature pyramid network. So the idea is actually to add a, um, a, um, a reverse transition from the net part to the backbone part. The backbone part. So and that's a uh, this is in the recursive recursive way. So uh, and during training, the we will unroll this part into sequential tasks uh, into sequential operations. So actually, the the backbone are looking at the images for twice, and, and, and I, we know that that is a trend in the uh, object detection area. And that that is to look at it twice and think of twice. So this model is uh, let the backbone part to look at the image for twice and think for twice. And the backbone, uh, and the, the bad field world can also give the gra gradient gain from the head direct to the backbone part. So it will get, bad, get better uh, training performance uh, as well as well as both the, class, uh, the, 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 the detection performance. And the second, mm, and second module named the switched a trials revolution. Actually, in, it, is, mm, it has two extra uh, reads for each convolution layer. So the, the one with the smaller, uh, a trust convolution can look more at more detailly, and the one with bigger a trust rate will mm, look to the uh, will get more global information. And bias uh, and using a switch, mm, they can uh, combine these two kind of information and uh, get a better result. And uh, we put our focus on the bottom part because the the bottom part is more related to the data set, and we find this part is more challenging because the the upper part is uh, are dealing with the the features which is where it's traded from the images, so they are more data set environment environment, but the bottom part are directed related to the data set. So we have to do more modifications to the bottom part to make the model more adapted to this data set. So the, the, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problem in such videos is the, due to the limited, due to the, uh, some problems of the image sensor and the, the, the surgery, the surgical videos are usually with not, um, are with not very good properties. So like the blurring noise is brightening. For example, in these images, we can, we can see the, 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 the tape of the instrument. I don't know its name. It, it's, it's in lines. I don't know um, the name of this phenomenon. I, I think it's something like modern patterns or something like that. Uh, so, this is not a. This is due to the encoding process or due to the censoring process. This is not a big problem for the daughters, but it's a problem for the um, CV models. So, um, to better address this problem, we give very strong data augmentations to the data set. Um, there are two popular uh, data augmentation libraries now, which is, the first one is the image org and the second one is the augmentations. So we use most of the available augmentation in these two libraries. And we find a, a huge performance boost after we use this data augmentations. Uh, in the baseline model, the other side, 
they achieved the best performance with ResNet 24 or ResNet 50. And they observed uh, an overfitting in the ResNet 101. But with this strong data augmentation, we find the usually the ResNet 50 have a better performance than ResNet 24. And the, and the training of the REST 101 become possible if we use the strong data augmentation. So, and um, our second best perform uh, score are obtained with uh, simply REST 50 and uh, data augmentation with no other modifications. So, we think the data augmentation is very important for this task. Uh, the the other part is the we use several um, backbone models to better extract the, the the features from the images. The first one is REST Nest, and I think this one has been introduced by the uh, previous presentation. So we will skip this part. And the second one. The second backbone is named ICNet, and this is from a new paper in CVPR 2020. And the idea is to give the convolutions, give the convolutional layers the ability to, uh, to get a, a bigger but more accurate uh, attention area. Um, so this is very important for the object, de object detection task and the instance segmentation task. And we think this may this this ability may help us our model um, to get better object detection performance. So we gave us a lot of tests on this model, and um, some of them was, but some of them are not work. So we will include all the results in our report. Uh, and the third one is to use an attention data model. The, this model is initially used for the UNET, UNET model. It's used for the segmentation. The basic idea is to use, uh, before, we, uh, before the combination uh, between the, the features from the encoder and the decoder, we use the, 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 the the features from the lower lower level to get a heat signal to give to which it can serve as a mask for the for the features from the sleep transitions. So we can only get the truly useful information from the encoder. And so usually with the attention data model we can get um, larger areas in the organs in the in the instruments, but get and get a little area in the background. So within this technology can also make the uh, uh, object detection performance better. And here is uh, all the performance we uh, of our um, in our experiments, and we are submitting this two results um, uh, in the last two rounds. And this one is got um, with the rest nest. And uh, a weird thing is this one got the best performance in the validation set, but it got a very poor performance on the test set. So um, we think that maybe some um, some problem with the validation set and the test set because um, or maybe they are uh, overfitting in the in our model in the validation set. And the, the and the last submission in the in this is also with the ResNet 50 and uh, we fit the ways fit the parameters for the first two layers. So it is, um, I think, the, the, this operation can address the overfitting problem. Uh, that's all, thank you.
Thank you. Um, if I may ask one question, is it's not totally clear, maybe you said it's not totally clear to me what of these architecture you end up actually using in your sub in your top submission. So you said your top submission is just ResNet 50 with data augmentation. Yeah. Is that correct? So you're not actually yeah, using I've, any of these uh, other innovations that you mentioned in your presentation? No, 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 no. Uh, I mean, the, the best submission is with the ResNest as the backbone, with the data, uh, data automation as the data engineering. But we are also using the LSTM and the uh, IFP and the SAC for the net and for the transmission head. So, um, I mean, in the backbone, we are only use the ResNest. And we test the performance for the SC net and for other backbones, but we find it, um, it's not as good as the as, uh, REST nest. And I, I think this result it, um, is also um, proved by the uh, previous team. They are also using yeah. the REST nest. Uh, thanks for clarifying. Uh, it wasn't clear to me. So now it's clear that you are also incorporating all these other things in the top, in the top layers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, okay, the next team is from Beijing University. Okay. Sergio. So, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so. Um, um, well, um, hello, everyone. I'm honored to be here to introduce our method adopted in the Saros ESET event on behalf of my team. So the topic of our presentation is the application of RetinaNet with ResNext in Saros ESET event. And the team name is CTW. The team members are Rui Jia Wu, Shuang Chen, and Yang Tang. So the presentationer today is Rui Jia Wu. And the presentation is divided into four parts. And first, I will introduce our team members. Second, I will introduce the major model um, adopted in the challenge task. And third, third, the promising method we found during the experiment period. And at last, I will analyze the results um, generated by uh, these two models. So first introduction, and Rui Jia Wu, Shuang Chen, and Yang Tang are all master students from the Pattern Recognition Laboratory of the School of Information and Communication Engineering, Beijing University of Posts and Telecommunications. Um, our research direction is medical image processing. Um, so next part two. Um, in this part, I will introduce the specific architecture of the major model and the training details. So first, let me explain why we also use the retina net. Um, among the results generated by the baseline models, we can find that the baseline model with focal loss can generate a much better result on the test set. And furthermore, we find that the baseline model and the retina net both adopt feature pyramid network and a focal loss. So this indicated that the architectures of them are similar or essentially the same. And we noticed that the target of the SARAS project is to um, build uh, the real-time detection. So we think um, among the algorithms for object detection, the one-stage algorithm may be better so based on these facts, we choose RetinaNet to complete the challenge task. And however, uh, we did not use the ResNet to, to be the backbone. Instead, we choose an improved version of ResNet, that is ResNext. Uh, we found that 
ResNex combines inception module and ResNet with group convolution, and it can improve classification accuracy without any computation resource increment. So here, concretely, we choose the ResNex 101 64 by four dimensions as the backbone. And um, during the experiment period, we adopt a powerful tool. And I believe that most of you have already heard or used it. That is MM detection. It's really a convenient tool. What we need is to modify the configuration file um, as with our ideas, and then the model can be trained just in the way we want. And so for details, first the data, we pre-process the training, validation, and test the data set at first. Specifically, the size of the original images are rescaled into 1067 by 600 in proportion. And then we process the training and validation sets in the format of the COCO data set. So for training skill, we download the model pre-trained on COCO data set on the model zoo. Uh, this is a platform provided by MM Detection. And then we fine tune the model with several epochs. As for the evaluation metric, in order to make a fair comparison, we did not pay attention to the function provided by MM detection itself to test the performance of the network. Instead, we generated the whole set submission file in the same way as generating the test set submission file and compute the mean average precision using the function supplied in the baseline model. And about the experimental results and analysis, we will, I will describe it in detail in the fourth part. And uh, next, uh, let's go to part three. In this part, I will introduce the promising method, guided anchoring we found. And uh, also, I will talk about the specific architecture and training skills. So at first, let's review the guided anchoring. It leverages semantic features to generate a sparse anchoring scheme, which is more efficient and effective than prior region proposal algorithms. It generates non-uniform anchors of arbitrary shapes by gently predicting the locations and anchor shapes dependent on locations. However, due to the limitation of computing resources, GA Retina Net with the same backbone as the major model mentioned before is difficult to run on our machine. So we adopted a compromising strategy and we used the 101 32 by four dimension version of ResNext as a backbone of the GA Retina Net. So here we also use the MM detection to implement the experiments and actually the configuration is similar to the one for the uh, major model. And as for the training steel, um, actually it's the same as part two. We rescale the pictures in proportion and fine tune the model pre-trained on Google data set. And finally, generate the vote submission file to evaluate the performance of model. And so at last, let's um, analyze the results and the reason behind it. So here uh, we tested the two algorithms introduced before as a validation set. And we can see that the algorithms that have been fine-tuned for different epochs performs very differently on the whole set. They initially showed ups and downs, but then with the number of epochs increased, um, mean average precision began to decline. We originally speculated that such a performance implies that it will have the same effect on the test set. However, their performance on the test set really surprised us. Um, the results on the test set 
show that the performance on road sets is actually not closely related to its on test set. So among the results we submitted, uh, RetinaNet after fine tuning for epochs achieved the highest results and it also exceeded the baseline results. We believe that there are two main reasons uh, for why RetinaNet can obtain such results. And we think one is a focal loss and the other is a rest next. So let's analyze the reasons behind it in detail. First, the focal loss. Let's look at this picture. It's obtained from the paper published by the competition organizer. It describes the number of samples of each category in the training validation and test the data set. You can see in the Sarosi set data set, the imbalance of categories is a very prominent feature of this data set. In the paper that proposed focal loss, it pointed out that class imbalance is an important reason why the one-stage detection algorithm is difficult to surpass the two-stage algorithm. And therefore, focal loss is, is specially designed to address the difficulty of improving accuracy caused by category imbalance. And we think that this is also why the use of focal loss in the baseline model can achieve the best results. And so next, let's see why the second reason is rest next. Um, the result of the detection task consists of the accuracy of the position of founding box and the classification accuracy. Observing the detection results, we found that the position of most bounding boxes is relatively close to ground truth, but the classification accuracy is not ideal. Um, so the picture on this slide shows the class average precision of the baseline model during training. Um, noted, noted that uh, we have no extra statistics on the class AP during retina net training. And uh, since, since the structure of retina net and the baseline are the same, so we think it's okay to use the class AP diagram of the baseline to explain the, uh, to describe the problem. Um, it can be seen that the average precision of each category fluctuates in the early stage of training. After a certain number of trainings, the average precision of each category begin to um, converge, but there are still quite a few categories with very low AP, which has also become the difficulty of this challenge. And let's review the structure of ResNext, which combines ResNet and the inception module and aggregates many residual transformations in a group convolution. Um, which makes it perform better than ResNet in classification tasks. So in this challenge, replace the ResNet with ResNext, the classification accuracy will also be better than ResNet, thereby improving the final detected MAP. And next, uh, let's see why guided anchoring is a promising method. Look here. Um, both being fine-tuned for two epochs, GA retina net performs much better than retina net, although the difference of backbone may interfere. However, look at the classification performance of ResNext 101, 32 by four dimension and 64 by four dimension. It's obvious that 64 by four dimension is better than 32 by four dimension. And we also considering the performance of GA Retina Net and Retina Net on the Coco data set. Um, based on this, we speculated that if the backbone of GA Retina Net is replaced with the 64 by 40 dimen uh, dimension of the ResNext, the detection results will be improved further. And in summary, we find that adopting rest next as backbone can effectively improve the mean average precision and guided anchoring is a promising method to improve the result. Mm, 
that the relationship between both set and test set is still not very clear. So that's all. Thank you for your watching. Any questions? Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in the uh, guided uh, anchoring mechanism. I wasn't familiar with it. Can you can you explain it a little bit better? To me? How does it work? Uh, the gu guided uh, guided anchoring idea. Guided guided yeah. anchoring idea. Uh, it's uh, uh, in this. Um, look at a uh, look at this. Um, this is a, a specific architecture of the guided anchoring. And actually, it uh, uh, proposed a method to uh, predict the location of the anchor. And at the same time, um, predict the shape of the anchor um, based on the location to, to generate the anchors. Actually, it it uh, proposed that um, in the prior detection algorithm, the uh, the anchor is generated in the dense way, and uh, in this method, it uh, use this way to uh, to build a sparse anchor generating scheme. I and, see. Uh, yeah. And that's done separately at every level of the future pyramid. Uh, I beg your pardon, can you see that again? Yeah. That happens at every level of the feature pyramid. Feature pyramid? Yeah, feature in, your, in your picture, there's a feature pyramid and, and guided anchoring takes place at every level of the, of the pyramid? Um, actually, you can look here. Um, all of our experiments are based on the MM detection. So actually, oh sorry, this mm -hmm. plate, this platform um, pro provided the, the the prototype of the GA retina net, and then uh, concretely, um, you can uh, I think uh, look at this configuration file. Uh, the guided anchoring is used in the uh, retina net. The you see, the location is the head. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Maybe you can explain it a bit more in your report because that will make it a bit different from the other participants. Um. So can you see that? Can you see that again? I mean, uh, on the on the G, in this G resonant architecture. Maybe you can highlight it more in your report, the details and its effects that will separate it from the other participants. Other participants. Uh, so we'll we'll um, we'll have a discussion on your contributions to the to the journal paper. Do you understand? Um, no. So every every top participant team is supposed to contribute to the journal paper that we are writing for this challenge. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so guided anchoring is an interesting thing. So it, it's worth uh, talking about it in the paper. Oh yeah, yeah. I okay. will. Uh, okay, okay. So I, it, it's, it's a good a good point to summarize. So. Um, we are going to write a, a journal paper on this challenge and we are inviting all the top participant teams to contribute. So every team is supposed to write like a, maybe a three page document describing, or as long as you want, describing um, your approach and the results and some discussion um, on these results. And then we will integrate them in the, in the paper. So we'll put everything together and, and generate a single journal paper that uh, we will submit to medical image uh, analysis. Is that clear to everybody? So 
Vivek will send emails to, to coordinate this in the next few days. Okay, so yeah. maybe we can we can summarize Vivek. Do you think uh, yeah. uh, time? Or there is something we forgot? Uh, yeah, I think you can summarize it now. Okay, then I would like to thank everybody for attending uh, this first edition of the SADAS uh, Action Detection Challenge. Um, we are quite happy with it, so we thought that filled a gap um, in both surgical and surgical robotics and computer vision from, from a surgical robotics point of view, uh, because uh, actual detection was never tried before, and from a computer vision point of view, because of the specific features of, of endoscopic videos that have been highlighted by Vivek and by several of the participant teams. So, also the difficulty of um, uh, induced by class imbalance associated with you know different videos performed by different uh, by different surgeons so all these issues have been highlighted in this challenge um, and we will continue to work on this so the 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 future evolutions of this challenge will include as already mentioned um, extending accuracy from from uh, frame uh, ap to video ap so we want to test uh, action tube detection techniques so they can take care of sequences of frame to create uh, to link up detections in time to create action tubes as is standard in the action detection community we want to include more videos in particular the seven videos from the SADAS, um, uh, second platform and uh, what else and we want to use additional uh, propose additional tasks so from video MAP to also predicting future future actions so anticipating and predicting future actions as highlighted in uh, in Juan's uh, keynote um, so keep watching this space because we are going to build on this effort and probably submit another challenge uh, next year to, to meet Kai or possibly again MIDL. Um, I would like to thank uh, uh, the invited speakers, uh, Juan Vax from Purdue uh, for his promptness in accepting our invitation and very interesting presentation which we will follow up in a separate uh, separate conversation. Um, Ricardo Moradore, the coordinator of SARAS, uh, for his introduction to SARAS, and Carmela from Hospital San Raffaele, Landolfo. And I would like to organize Vivek, my, um, uh, who's a research fellow in my lab, for taking care, like shouldering the effort, organizing the challenge, everything. So, Congratulations to Vivek, well done. I think uh, we can be very happy with the result. And unless there are any final questions or considerations, uh, I would call it a day. It's been a long session already. Everybody's tired. Um, but feel free to ask any questions or make any points before we close. No, so I understand people are happy with uh, concluding now. And again, thanks again for your participation and possibly see you next year. <laughs>